The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, this is Mary Boo. Welcome to our webinar, Parents as Changemakers, Effective Policy Advocacy. I'm excited to have you all here today and advocacy is one of the things that's near and dear to what uh, NACAC has done and excited to share some information with you. I am here today, I am Executive Director of NACAC and am uh, proud to have worked with many parents and young people as advocates over the years on taking folks to congressional visits and doing legislative advocacy here in Minnesota. And uh, there's, I think there's nothing more powerful than the voices of those who are most affected by child welfare systems. And that's why I'm glad to see so many people signed up for this webinar today. And I am pleased to introduce Marissa Sanders, and I'll let her introduce herself, and she's going to be co-presenting with me today. Hello, everyone. Um, glad we have some great people on the on the webinar with us. As Mary said, my name is Marissa Sanders, and I work with NACAC on um, the CHAMPS program, which you're about to hear about. And I'm also the director of the West Virginia Foster Adoptive and Kinship Parents Network, and a foster adoptive parent myself. And um, as my, my, for my role in West Virginia, I do a lot of advocacy um, here, and I also worked in disability rights for 20 years, so I did a lot of advocacy in that role. So it's also something that I'm really passionate about, and especially in making sure that um, we all have a voice in the process that, affect, you know, the policies that affect us. So this is a great way to learn how to really elevate our voices as caregivers and as um, important people in this system. Thanks, Marissa. Um, before we get into the meat of the presentation, I want to do just a bit of housekeeping. Um, is, as a webinar, we will, everyone's phones will be muted uh, or your computer audio will be muted. But if you have questions, please type them in the question box. There are a couple times, um, and we'll, we have some set times we'll break for questions, so we'll take a look at those when we get to those sections. And, um, and if you're having any other problems, just uh, let us know, type in there. We'll try to uh, fix it what we can. Um, and again, we, we have a couple things. We hope this is interactive. We have a couple times where we'll ask you to type something in there just uh, to tell us about like what you're working on or we have some polls. So we do hope you'll participate with us today as we as we talk. We don't want it to be just us talking. We'd really like to hear from you as much as possible. I'm going to start uh, talking a little bit about children need amazing parents. and. Again, one of the things that we said is that you know parents can be advocates for all sorts of things. One of the things we're involved in these days is the CHAMPS campaign, and it's a national campaign to ensure bright futures for kids in foster care by promoting the highest quality parenting. And NACAC is part of it because we know how important it is for children to have the best care they can when they can't be with their birth parents. And the campaign is a collaboration of many funders, including the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Aviv Foundation, the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, and a number of other local funders and NACAC is one of the national partners. We're here to raise the uh, voices of foster parents, uh, as are the National Foster Parent Association. Foster Club is the leading partner raising the voices of young people who've been in care. The Youth Law Center is involved, Christian Alliance for Orphans, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Children's Defense Fund. So again, a bunch of us have come together trying to uh, spur policy reforms at the state level um, that will prioritize quality foster parenting and ensure foster parents have the training and support they need to help children heal, grow, and thrive. So that's the goal of CHAMPS, and we uh, suspect that many of you, we looked at the registration list, and a lot of you are foster adoptive parents, some of you are professionals in the field, and again, I think we're all in it for the same reasons, which is to ensure that children get the best care they can, um, whether in their birth families um, or foster families or adoptive families. And so again, this webinar is broadly about advocacy, but we'll do a little bit of talking about CHAMPS and some of its goals, because some of those goals align with uh, what many parents care about. So the um, 
CHAMPS has six policy priorities, and they're here on the screen. Uh, the first is supporting relationships with birth and foster families, knowing that that's a critically important role for children to have their birth and foster families working together to ensure their best interest when a child is in foster care. Um, next is to look at data-driven recruitment and retention practices, what really makes a difference to find and to keep foster parents for kids in care. Um, and then two, we're going to be talking a little bit more about, because um, there's some of the goals that we see come up most often in advocacy, um, engaging foster parents in decision making. We know that uh, while, a parent, while someone is caring for a child, they are the expert on that child and need to be engaged and trusted as a resource for the children. Um, another thing that's critically important is providing access to trusted, dedicated staff and peer support. And we at NACAC are huge proponents of peer support. And as Marissa said, she is running the West Virginia Parent Association. We just know that support from other parents who've lived the experience is really helpful for kids and a huge policy and advocacy goal for us. Um, Two other of the goals are prioritizing placements with family members, so valuing kinship care and keeping those family connections whenever possible, um, and they're almost always possible in some way or another, and ensuring timely access to physical and mental health services. So those are the broad CHAMPS policy goals, and there is a great tool that I hope you will um, go check out if you haven't seen it already. Ready. It's at fosteringchamps.org, and I can type that in the chat box if folks needed that web address. But um, the CHAMPS Policy Playbook is a great resource for people who are interested in advocacy on some of these issues, on how to improve uh, foster parenting so kids will have better care. And it looks at, it has presents some research on why some of these issues matter, and it highlights what some states have done, some policies, some practices that states have employed, which is a really important thing in advocacy is to be able to say, hey, this state is doing this, doing it this way, we could too. And so it's got really helpful things in your advocacy world. Um, and I'm going to talk, as I said, I'm going to talk a little bit more about two of the two of the policy goals, and we'll talk a little bit more about them throughout the webinar. The first is engaging foster parents in decision making. And again, you'll a lot of this information is in the policy playbook. But you'll see what we know, I'm guessing, so any of you who are foster parents, um, how many of you think you were properly engaged in decision making about the kids in your care? And again, you can just, you could type that in the question box if you want, or you can just uh, think the answer. But I'm guessing that most of you, what we hear from most people is not very many are as engaged in the way that they think would be best for the kids in their care. And well, the other thing is we've seen is that research has shown that foster parents' involvement in case planning improves foster parent satisfaction and uh, intent to continue fostering. And what we know is that's good for kids when we have parents who are experienced and kids don't have to move because their foster parent no longer is able to participate. And we know that foster parents often say lack of involvement is one of the main reasons they leave and that they quit. And so that's why this is a critical policy issue. And there are some um, policy and practice changes that you may want to advocate in this area. One is inclusion in uh, including foster parents in team meetings. So making sure that policies are in place that show that foster parents are essential members of the team and that workers need to respect that and invite them to participate. Similarly, uh, inclusion in court hearings. Uh, federal law requires notification of foster parents for court hearings, but it doesn't always happen. And so state policies can reinforce that and help make sure that caseworkers know that there are ways to facilitate participation. Another really great way to engage foster parents in decision making is to have a foster parent advisory board. And there are a number of states, including Illinois and Missouri, that have very active boards that are truly participating in the process and helping design policies, raise issues, raise awareness. That's another advocacy goal you might want to pursue. Um, and then another thing to consider is a foster care bill of rights, which can have some of these issues related to engagement in um, as part of that advocacy role. Um, so the next uh, part of the CHAMPS advocacy agenda that I think many of you might want to be advocating for is providing timely access to trusted staff and peer support. And again, what we know is that uh, foster parents say the most important thing about 
to make sure they can care for their kids is that they have connect to somebody who can answer questions and help explore things with them. Um, research has shown that support is one of the things that keeps parent, foster parents engaged and decreases placement failure. And of course, we also know this. I know many of you are adoptive families as well. Um, and that that's a critical role in, in adoption as well, that ongoing support helping with parent strategies. Um, and so there are some policy recommendations here that you might advocate to improve this in your community. One is um, a different kind of worker. So maybe you would have a peer support worker. Uh, there's program Clark County, for example, has a champions program where experienced foster parents become agency staff and provide support to their uh, to other foster parents. They, you might have a dedicated caseworker, so not the child's caseworker, but uh, another agency staff member who is really there to support the entire foster family and has that as their priority throughout the process. Um, obviously, um, funding and support of support groups and foster parent associations is an advocacy goal. Some states are very engaged with those associations or support groups and provide funding and ongoing support to them. And that's something you might uh, advocate for. Another thing is a kinship navigator program. If your focus is on relative care, these are great programs that have support to relative caregivers as they negotiate the system. So that's just a little bit about CHAMPS, beginning to want to get you thinking a little bit about some of the policy goals that we are talking about as part of that work. But as I said, uh, what we'll learn here today in the advocacy can apply to almost anything you want to be advocating for. And I am going to, uh, now we're going to do a little poll as I, and after this I'll turn it over to Marissa. So we have a poll for what is advocacy, and we, if you don't mind, if you just click on this, click on your answer, and then uh, we'll we'll show the results, and we'll just turn it over to Marissa to talk a little bit more about what me, we mean when we talk about advocacy. While everyone's voting, can I jump in and say something, Mary? Of course. Um, I just wanted to add, and Mary already touched on this, but I wanted to strengthen it a little bit. When um, when we talk about peer support, I often have a lot of policymakers say to me, well, what is our role in peer support? We're not foster parents. You know, we can't provide peer support. So what is the policy role? And the answer that I always give them is to fund it. And Mary mentioned it, but that to me is the, you know, whether that's funding their, your state association or, um, you know, and funding some staff to help coordinate and support those support, support groups, whether it's giving actual money to the support groups for things like advertising and refreshments and meeting space and those kinds of things. But um, to me, that's a, a really easy policy answer when, when policymakers ask me that is we got to have some funding in order to support this because a lot of times people try to do it all volunteer and there are states where that works, but it's really challenging to keep people engaged. And, you know, it's a lot to ask of people who are already busy as foster parents. So I one think, of the things I like to highlight is you can help us out by funding it. <laughs> and I think it's really great. And we can talk about this when we talk a little bit more about, you know, sort of making your ask. But I think that's one of the things that people rarely understand that they'll or and people will say, well, why do these parents need support? any differently than others. And we'll talk a little bit more about when you're making your case and telling your stories. And um, and one of the things is, you know, talking about the difference of parenting kids who've experienced trauma and loss and, and also, again, complicated lives, talking about all of the many things that foster adoptive parents, the appointments, the court hearings, the things that they have to go to, and then you're asking them to run support groups and coordinate a program all for nothing. Um, so yes, I think funding, the answer to so many advocacy things is funding, but not everything. Mm -hmm. And that's important to yeah. also have some things out there that don't cost money. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, so Marissa, I'm going to turn it over to you here. The results, the poll results are showing and I will turn it over to you. Great. And everyone got it right. <laughs> um, you are all correct. So a lot of times people think of advocacy as being this sort of big, scary thing, or it's, they're not really sure what, how to define it. So we gave you a few examples, attending a protest, um, writing a letter, making a call to an elected official, participating in a local parent group or association, or influencing a decision. And really all of those are advocacy. Um, so even when you might think you're not doing advocacy, often you are. Um, and on the next slide, we will talk a little bit more about that. Um, if you can think about a time when you were nervous to make a request, um, 
maybe you felt anxious about asking for something, but you were successful in getting what you asked for. Um, and then tell me in the chat, and you can type in the, the chat comments, um, what made your request successful? Why were you able to get what it is? Was there something that you did, something about you, um, something in the way you asked? I can get a few people to comment, that'll help me out. Um, for example, I was thinking about um, when, when I was a teenager, I asked my parents to um, give me a monthly budget that was equal to what they would spend on things like shampoo and conditioner and clothes and things for me so that I could pick out what I wanted. Um, and I was nervous about trying to do that because I thought they're not going to give me this money. And um, But I did some research. I thought about how much I would need. And I... Um, I sold it to them as this is going to teach me how to budget and how to manage my money and you know I'm and figure out what are my priorities are in spending and um, I think those things the research and the the thinking that I did and kind of thinking about it from their perspective helped me to be successful in getting them to do that and Mary yeah. are there I'm not yeah. seeing any of these yeah so that so we had um Lisa, if I forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, talked about persistence and follow up are some of the mm -hmm. things that made her quest successful. And I, I'll say, Marissa, tagging me off of your example, I know there was a time where my siblings and I wanted to have our parents change a rule, and what helped us was coming together on it and making the making the pitch together, sort of as a partnership. Um, mm -hmm. Even though we were sort of different ages, we could we could make it. Uh, we could make the case together, which I think helped. Yeah. Any other comments? Nope. I don't have any other comments. Okay. okay so all of those things, research, uh, persistence, and what was the other thing? Uh, working with others, follow up. Yeah. And coming together and follow up. All of those things are what make part of what make a great advocate. So even though you might think you've never done advocacy or it maybe feels like this big sort of nebulous thing. In reality, we all do advocacy pretty much every day. Every time we request something, every time we put some effort into thinking about something we want changed and how we might make that happen, that's advocacy. <laughs> so don't let it feel like it's a big overwhelming thing. Um, and we'll, on the next slide, um, essentially advocacy is raising your voice. So your voice matters. And as foster parents, especially in adoptive and kinship, we can all make such a difference by sharing the information that we have and the knowledge that we have, um, but to really make a difference in the policies and the systems that affect us every day, we have to advocate. Um, so sharing our stories, sharing our experiences, those are really the best advocacy tools. And especially as I have, I just started our state association about a year ago. And as I've sort of seen that grow and, and been at the legislature and done some other advocacy things, it's been amazing to me to see how pleased people are to hear directly from people who are impacted by the policies because they're so used to hearing from the other people who are making the policies, the state agencies, the private agencies, um, for them to hear the, the sort of on the ground stories, the real life stories of how their policies are impacting people has been really valued by a lot of people. Um, and then, you know, policymakers can't fix what they don't know. So if we don't tell them how it's really impacting us in the real world, then they can't change it. Um, and that's where having our perspective is so important because often I spend a lot of time saying, well, this is what policy says, but this is how that plays out in the real world. Um, and that may, those may be two different things and sometimes they are. Um, so, um, we have another poll. Mary, do you want to take that over? Um, if you can. I am going to launch this next yeah. poll. And while people are answering that, I'll just uh, say again, uh, echoing what Marissa said about getting involved is that people want to hear from their constituents. And they, as I, I really want to say, they want to hear how if they've passed a law and it's not doing what they want, they want to know that too. I mean, they're, um, that is a huge piece of advocacy is also sort of following up and both telling them what worked and what didn't work. And I think that's really right. useful for people to hear. Absolutely. And a lot of times people are afraid to advocate because they feel like they're not the expert or maybe they don't know the law inside and out or they don't understand the process, which is part of why we're doing this webinar. So you will. But um, 
really, we are the experts on what's happening in our homes and how these policies in, impact us. So that's really important to remember. Um, so looking at what are your top advocacy goals? Uh, oh, we have a tie. Uh, more peer support and other. Um, can we have some people comment in the chat box about what your other is? Um, so more peer support, we just did a survey in West Virginia and that was really one of the top issues that came out too for us. And I spend a lot of time telling legislators, you know, we have, we as foster parents, we're surrounded by people who, I mean, we have people in and out of our homes all the time, but it's really hard sometimes to talk about the realities of day-to-day -day life with people who aren't living it. Um, and so having other people who really get it from a, a real world perspective is so important. Um, better preparation and training is also um, as a kind of our second top answer there. So um, okay. absolutely yeah. training and, and prep are so important. Go ahead, Mary. Oh, I was going to say that we have uh, one participant, Tony, wrote working to ban conversion therapy for LGBTQ plus youth. Wow. Um, certainly a huge advocacy issue that absolutely. sadly we are still <laughs> hiding. Yes. Um, and then someone else is uh, wants to inform them about champs and respond to the issues in partnership with adoptive foster and kin bio families. That's from Shannon. So thank you. We awesome. look like we have another. Um, we have somebody in Wisconsin is how to ensure the needs of the child is at the forefront. So that um, how do you give the child space to heal instead of over traumatizing them because of parent rights? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the other things that folks are working on. Awesome. Those are all really important advocacy goals. Um, so, you know, we put four options on that poll, but there can be any number of, of different. Uh, Mary mentioned the Foster Care Bill of Rights, which is something we're working on in West Virginia. We're also looking at a centralized database of foster parents to help both streamline um, placement and also to help us with targeted recruitment and really identify where the gaps are. And then uh, we're having a big issue with our guardians and light ad litem not always being as responsive as they are. So that's also one of our, or as they should be as responsive as they should be. Uh, that's one of our policy priorities this year as well. So um, any questions at this point? You can go ahead and type in the chat box or the questions. I'll give a minute for that. Yeah, and I'll just say that as Marissa, so some of the things that NACAC is working on at the state level this year, we're doing some things on adoption assistance, trying to, there's some barriers for kids who are uh, over 18 and should be eligible to remain on, but the law is, makes it a little difficult for them to continue to get the assistance. And then we've worked on some equal, trying to equalize adoption assistance and kinship assistance with foster care benefits. So those are some of the things that we've worked on in recent years, in addition to um, funding for support programs is a big, two years ago we were, we did that and were able to get certain federal funds dedicated uh, to be used for, to support adoptive foster and kinship families, which we're pretty excited about. So it looks like we don't have any other questions right now, so I'll go okay, forward well, with the next thing. Yep, right. I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Okay. Um, and so again, here we're going to talk about what are the advocacy steps. And the first and most important, uh, you've already done by being here um, and being interested, is to step up as a leader. And um, and we, we're doing a lot of talking about how you can make a difference and you will make a difference. And we just want to, we know both of us in our experience have seen lots of parents and others say, well, I don't, you know, I don't know how to do it. I'm worried about it. And the great thing about it is that advocacy is pretty easy, um, especially if you're just telling your story and telling how things affect you and what could make it better. Um, so the first and foremost, come to this training, ask us questions afterwards. Um, that's what you've done as a leader. You can, uh, we'll talk more about bringing people together to work on it with you. Um, so embracing yourself as the expert that you are as an advocate is the first and most important step. And the rest of these, I'm just going to go kind of quickly through because I'm going to talk about each one um, individually. Uh, each has its own slides, so I'm not going to go through them here, but I'm going to talk about it. So you always want to, um, but these are the different things that uh, we're going to cover today about how to be an advocate. Um, and so after the, um, you know, so you've already stepped up, then you have to figure out what are you advocating for? And, you know, you have to have an ask and it can be specific. It can be, it can be, I want $10,000 to fund 
a foster care advisory and start a foster care advisory board. It can be general. We need more investment in peer support in our community. But no matter what, you need to know what you're asking for before you start communicating with uh, whether it's legislators, people in the executive branch or the media. And you have to know not just what... Um, what's wrong, but what might make it better. Even if you don't have all the answers you want to know, you have to have some, you have to be really solution focused. Um, and a couple things about when you're developing that ask is you should always make your ask from the child's point of view. So for example, if you say you want more support for foster parents, you want to phrase it about the child. Children deserve to have caregivers who have the skills and abilities to meet their needs. If you want more engagement in case planning, children do better when their foster parents can share information about what's happening in their lives and what's working for them. And then um, I, Marissa just mentioned the Foster Care Bill of Rights they're working on. And, and often people will talk about a foster parent bill of rights. And I would highly encourage you to call it a foster care bill of rights and include rights for the children and youth too and to make sure the way it's phrased, it's about the kids. Because what we know is when foster parents, adoptive parents are talking about their need for support, it's all so that they can do a better job of caring for the kids in their homes. And so just keep that in mind as you're working on your ask. We talk about this when we talk about adoption assistance. You want to talk about that as a benefit to the child and um, that that's a benefit tied to the child and can meet the child's needs. So those are ways, really important things when you have your ask is to have the child at the forefront of your mind. And, and at virtually everything we're doing is about the kids. So it's not too hard to make sure you do that language that way. Second is making sure that your language is easily understood and you don't want jargon, initials, insider phrases. And um, Marissa and I were doing a training recently and the foster parents in the room were talking about that they wanted improvements in what I think they called the red book. I probably have the name wrong, but something like that. We both looked at each other like, what's the red book? Uh, we didn't have any idea, but it turned out it was the information that about the child that was went with the child with new placements. And again, critically important. But again, if they were talking to policymakers and talking about, hey, we need to fix the red book, that's not going to mean anything to anybody. But you want to say that, uh, you know, talk about the information about the child that a caregiver gets in a new placement. So you have to watch those things. Again, we are all experts, so we have to remember what others don't know. Um, the next is to put the audience in the issue, you know, so what do they want for their, your child or a child you love? I think about this when we talk about group home placements or, um, and it's like, you know, if you couldn't care for your child, would, do you want them to go to an orphanage or do you want them to go to a relative? Do you want them to go to your, you know, when you've made that plan for a child and you, that you love, what do you want for them? So really bringing the person you're talking to into this, having them envision the children in their lives facing this same situation. And uh, this, I think, is so was really effective advocacy when young people advocated for the reasonable and prudent parent standard and being able to have sleepovers and um, go to camps and go in sporting events and all of the things that were barriers for kids in foster care and continue to be in spite of the law changing. Um, but really, because almost everybody can understand that they were remember from their child doing sleepovers or if they have kids, they know that's a huge part of their lives. And so helping make sure that when we talk about the kids, we're making sure they understand that these are kids like any other kids. It's not. Um, we want them to be invested in the children we're caring about and that we're advocating for. And then the final thing about the ask is you really want to be solutions focused, as I said earlier. I think when we are deep in a system, are incredibly frustrated, it can be so tempting to spend a lot of time about what's wrong. And we need to let people know what's wrong, but we need to let them know that there's a solution. They need to know that they can do something to make a difference. And so that's one of the things, when, like when we talk about the policy playbook, knowing what's working in other states. So if you say, we don't have enough peer support, but if you can say, but you know what, um, Missouri has funding for adoption resource centers and foster parent groups that are funding uh, support groups across the state. Minnesota has a peer support program, and this would be a great model for us. So letting folks know that there are things that are working, there are ideas out there that work, and that people are doing better when they have those solutions is a really important part of your ask, is knowing what might make it better. 
So the next thing, once you know what you're advocating for and how you're going to frame that, and, and I'll say that you, you want to think about where you're going to advocate. And I have to say it's a little bit of a chicken or egg situation with developing your ask because you can't, um, you can't know your ask exactly until you know where you're going to do your advocacy. But you start with what you want to make different, and then you look at it and you say, okay, who's, who's making the decisions that will make this better or can solve this problem. So say you want to create a foster care advisory board. If you're in a, you need to know, are you in a county run system or a state run system? If it's a county run system, you might go to the state, the county social services agency, and you don't need to go to the county commissioners or any elected officials. You might just go to the, um, the county DSS or DHS and make a suggestion for that. And that could be the end. You could solve it there. Or they may not, they may say, oh, we don't have bandwidth to do that. We would need some support. Well, then you might go to the county commission or to the state legislature and say, hey, we need to promote this. So we need legislation saying there has to be foster care advisory board and we have this funding to support them. So again, you have to kind of think about where your ask is and your ask might escalate. Um, you know, start at the, start sort of with the easiest and, and move up from there. And you may find that your, um, you're going to partner perhaps with the county agency or the state department of human services. They may be right with you and they just don't have funding. So they'd be happy to work with you as you advocate with the legislature. Um, and then sometimes obviously advocacy happens at the federal level. And this is, you know, so if you want, as I said, when we, um, so we at NACAC do lots of federal advocacy as well, trying to get, uh, make sure there's enough funding for the adoption incentive program, um, trying to get funding for adoption opportunities, seeking dedicated funding streams for support services. So there are things like that, that if, you know, if, if things are barriers in many states, then maybe federal advocacy is what it takes. And um, you can come together and talk to your members of Congress and you can, uh, so you might go to the federal level in order to spur your state to take action if your state isn't investing in the places you want it to. And another, before you start advocating, you want to make sure that you have data supporting your supporting your efforts, supporting your theories. So you want to know um, there are good places to go look. So AFGAR's data, which is available um, from the Children's Bureau website, um, often has state-specific data about the number of kids in foster care, the number waiting for adoption, the number of adoptions, uh, are kids in group placements. Um, and that is national data, but they have some state-specific data um, that you can look at as well. There are places, childwelfare.gov has good information on data. Your obviously state agency has wonderful, uh, has lots of rich data and they will often provide it. Um, People in the media often have good sources of information and can look at it. But you want to make sure that as you're advocating that you know, is this a problem affecting a very small group? That doesn't mean it's not worth advocating for, but you want to know, is this a big issue or a small issue? And then I one of the things, and Marissa can talk more about this as she mentioned already, they just did a survey um, of their uh, foster parents and gathered data about what's most important to them. And they had a great response rate. And that's great data to go to the legislature and say, you know, we talked to this many people and the top need they have is X. Um, so you can have your data that way as well. And the other, if you can't do a full survey, maybe you have focus groups, you talk to parents, you get their stories, you get their, their you know, qualitative information as well as quantitative. So you know something about how the, how many people this problem is going to be solving. And one thing I'll say, I said it a little bit earlier, um, is in terms of data, there's also some good, and again, people are looking for specific data. We, you can email us afterwards and we can see if we have any resources for you. But one of the things is to look at data in other states. So for example, if, um, if you know, 25% of the kids in your state are in group care and neighboring states or the national average is around 10%, well, then that's something that's part of your advocacy is say, we can do better. We are well below the national average. Um, if one, if a state nearby is spending quite a bit of money on foster care support or, um, and your state isn't, again, th these are things to bring up. So you want data about what's happening in your community, but also sometimes comparative data can be really useful, especially, again, this is one where you need to know your politics. So if you're in Texas and you tell them 
that uh, New York or California is spending X, they might not care because that politically is a very different state. But if you are in Minnesota and Wisconsin is doing something different, that might be okay. So again, you want to think about where your comparison is or comparing to the national, um, but that's important data to collect as well. And now I am going to turn it over to Marissa to talk more about um, partnering. <coughs> Excuse me, I unmuted too quickly there. Um, and before I jump into partnering, I'm gonna just uh, reinforce what Mary just said about making sure you think about which states you compare yourself to in terms of talking to policymakers. Um, living in West Virginia, and if we have any West Virginians on the call or even people in surrounding states, we have a very unique, and we're very, very rural with very limited resources. So if I were to say, well, California does this thing. In fact, one time I did say, well, in Oregon, they're doing this. And they looked at me and went, we wouldn't even have enough people if everybody in the state did that. <laughs> you know? like there's, we, we just couldn't do that. Um, but, and that doesn't mean that there aren't programs that we can borrow from those states. That doesn't mean that there aren't things we can learn. It just means that if I'm gonna say, well, I want us to be like this state, then I need to make sure that it's a state that has similar demographics and or at least is in the, in our region um, so that is important to think about so um, partners one of the biggest things about advocacy is it's really really nearly impossible to do alone I mean you can try and you'll, you will make some progress but to really impact state level or even federal policy you really have to do it um, in partnership with others um, so figuring out and that's partly because there's strength in numbers so whether it's having your association members all call into the same legislators or the same policymakers on a particular issue or it's having uh, everybody show up at the Capitol or it's working with several other organizations who are working on the same things um, having that strength of lots of people are bringing this issue to the forefront is really important to policymakers um, so the way you figure that out or you start to think about that is look at who else is working on this um, I don't know about every other state, but in West Virginia, we have a whole lot of people who are really interested in child welfare. A lot of um, organizations who, it, even if it's not their main focus, they're still interested. Um, and when we talk about legislative advocacy, I'll also talk about the fact that sometimes I am able to partner with groups that really aren't working on child welfare, but they happen to know somebody or have a perspective that I might need. Um, think about who you would need to bring in, so both the usual and unusual suspects. Obviously, bringing in families um, is important and helpful, and having those stories shared is always great. Um, bringing in youth, people don't always think about that, or even children. Um, I recently heard a presentation from one of our legislators, a senator, who said, some, I was at a conference where he had been asked to talk about the challenges of legislating child welfare. And he said, you know, one of the challenges, especially in the Senate, is that most senators tend to be older because they've usually been around for a while before they get to the Senate. Um, so they're not raising young kids, usually, they're, which means they're not going to places where young families are. Um, most of them in our state, anyway, are not teachers or working in a place where they're interacting with kids. So the bottom line is that they have limited access to children. And so when they're passing legislation and thinking about um, what kinds of policies to pass it's harder for them to think about how is this to connect that policy to how that's going to impact the children so one of the things that we're doing in west virginia is our legislative session starts next month and we're going to have a foster adoptive and kinship parents day at the capitol and i'm asking people to bring their children um, so that they can interact with legislators um, and legislators usually love kids so that makes it also gives you a little bit of an in sometimes but um, so kids might be an unusual suspect. There might be, as I said, some organizations that aren't really doing child welfare work per se, but have some unique perspectives. Um, in my world, a lot of times that's the disability community because so many kids in foster care have disabilities. And so I have a lot of contacts in the disability community. So sometimes I'll bring them in to talk about, you know, how a policy might impact the disability community or how they might be able to, to help partner and, and support some things. Um, think about what emerging leaders you want to recognize, elevate, and engage. So whether, again, whether that's foster parents or other leaders or youth. Um, give to get. Uh, this is really important because the, the goal in, in developing any kind of partnership and really in advocacy, you have to, you have to build the relationship. Uh, so much of advocacy is having a relationship or a relationship with someone who has a relationship with them. Um, so giving to get is important. And something that we just did in our network 
that I didn't really think of as an advocacy tool when I did it. I just kind of thought it might be something nice to do was I had in our Facebook group, I had our members just tell me some things that they really appreciated that their workers had done. And then I put those together into kind of a graphic thing, you know, just used Microsoft Publisher. And I sent that out to our um, child protection, protective services workers and to our child placing agency workers um, via the directors and everybody. But I said, could you get these to your staff just as a way of appreciating them and recognizing them? I was really surprised at the response I got, especially from the child placing agency directors. They were really grateful to have that feedback and, and they said their staff really appreciated getting that kind of just, you know, nice kind of warm fuzzy. It was Thanksgiving, um, but it's a nice way to just build the relationship and remind everybody that, you know, we might be advocating for changes, but that doesn't mean we don't want to work with you. Um, and we, you know, we want to appreciate the things that are going well. Um, and then, you know, work on your outre outreach efforts. So working with con trying to connect with other organizations and other people, I do a lot of asking somebody, who do you know who, who I could work with on this or who might be good at this and can you connect me to them? Um, you know, using other people's networks is, who are in my network is really important. And then just having a wide cross section of supporters. Um, so we have another poll for our next slide. We do, and I want to, um, before we launch the poll, I just want to say, sort of, I think, again, reiterating what you said, but the, um, the idea of thinking about your DSS or DHS as a partner and workers as your partner is something that I think we don't do often enough. Um, and again, it doesn't always work, and sometimes we're in an adversarial relationship, but I think there are often times where the agency is on the same page and would like to be advocates. So I think it's really important to think about those partnerships. And I, I think this ties in both to partners, but also to the give to get. And so if you can volunteer to be on a committee or you can um, do something to help out with events that DHS is doing or DSS is doing, then you can, you, you're getting to know people who have influence and who can connect you to others. And so, but I do just want to think, you know, so often we think of, of the, the state agencies as the problem when in fact, again, almost everyone is in this field because they want to do right by children and there may be policy or practice barriers that are keeping them and they may not, they cannot always advocate, but they might want to partner with you if you can. So I just want to, I think that's a partner yeah. we need to embrace. I agree a hundred percent. And that, and sometimes that's challenging because I don't always agree with them, but making sure that I'm maintaining that relationship, that I'm finding ways for us to work together. And then, you know, in that case, supporting their workers who are really on the ground, you know, um, just as a way to say, we know you have a tough job and we appreciate what you do. And um, that really got a great response from a lot of people. So that's often helpful. So now we have the poll. All right. And so we want to know who your um, partners are. And again, if you want to type it in the the question box as well, that would be great. Um, so when you guys have been doing your advocacy, and I'll say um, back to Tony's comment about the um, conversion therapy, that that's a great one. I mean, so many of us right now are partnering with uh, organizations with, whose primary purpose is the LGBTQ plus issues. It's certainly something that NACAC is working on. So thinking about um, those partnerships and they value working with the child welfare community because we can come from the perspective of, you know, this is what's right for kids. And so some of those partnerships are quite natural. And I, I think Marissa talked about the disability community, the mental health community. There's some others where, you know, where your intersection of the things you're working on are, um, are so important. And let me sh close the poll and show you the results. So our top answer was state or county child welfare agency. That's great. If that's your best partner, that's fabulous. The more we can advocate on the same page, the better. Um, tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to a meeting to help craft a large bill related to child welfare. And I know the state agency will be there and it'll be interesting to see how much we agree on and where we <laughs> where we differ, but you know, being having that relationship. And for me, Mary mentioned data earlier, for me to be able to reach out to the right person in the department and say, hey, can you get me the data on like a county by county number of kids in care or um, things that aren't just readily available on the website to have that relationship is so important. So I'm, I'm really glad to see that. Um, the private foster adoption agencies, 
if I were going to pick my best advocacy or my best partner, it would probably be Children's Home Society, which is one of our um, private agencies. And that's because they have they uh, we've built a relationship to where they not only have been able to help with advocacy and they many of the child placing agencies or the private agencies have lobbyists. So to be able to work with them is also helpful. And then um, in my case, Children's Home Society also shares a lot of kind of internal data and if they go to a meeting that I'm not at, they'll share information, which is really, really helpful. Um, Community-based organizations, I'm really glad to see that because that's not always obvious. And then do we have any comments about other? We do. Um, we have talked about a Behavioral Health Commission Board and um, they have open seats and you can meet county policymakers, DHS, CPS, mental health board or supervisors. So again, I think that Catherine is uh, really highlighting that importance of, again, if you can get on a board, get on a commission, you're going to meet other people who could be your partners and have lots of information. Um, and the other one, Alexia talked about state senator and that, and I think Marissa can talk more about this, but I, I'll say just so in our Minnesota advocacy, that has been uh, huge for us. And again, this is not rocket science, but we um, there was a legislator who brought his son uh, to the House floor one day, and his son had just been adopted from the Republic of Congo. And we reached out, and he's become a huge champion um, for these issues. And so finding somebody, even if they're not on the right committees, and again, I think Marissa can talk more about some of that committee stuff maybe in a little bit, but the if you find a champion who's a state legislator and who really cares about the issue, they can make so much happen. Um, and again, that we know that there are foster adoptive kinship care providers in there and finding them and, you know, checking the news, talking to others, you can find them. We have several that we've worked with um, who have a personal connection or personal knowledge about the issue. So Alexia, thank you for saying that as a partner. That's great. Um, so our next slide um, talks a little bit more about kind of the, um, okay, I'm missing a slide. Okay, never mind. Sorry, I'm looking at the slides and I'm missing something. Anyway, uh, developing recommendations. So your key will be to develop recommendations for your advocacy. So you really need to have kind of, as Mary said earlier, not just what the issue is, but what's your solution. Um, so think about who it's going to affect. If you come up with a solution, you really have to think through, you know, well, is this going to make the change that we need it to and who will it affect? And then um, the next thing, I don't seem to have this slide in my printout. So um, how much will it cost? That is a huge question for legislators, especially, um, or even county level or state level agencies. Um, how, mu how much will it cost if we implement this? Is it going to be $50,000 to support, you know, 50 support groups across the state? Or is it going to be to do support groups and training and respite care or something else? Um, but then also, how much will it cost if we don't implement it? So in our state, as I said, we just did that survey and peer support was a huge thing. We also have a retention issue. And a lot of people talk about needing to recruit more foster parents. But retaining foster parents is so important and nobody here has been talking about that. If we don't implement some changes in order to help retain foster parents, the cost of recruiting, spending, you know, our, our private agencies and our state agencies spending a lot of staff time and a lot of even advertising money and other things on big recruitment events and trying to recruit people and then all the time spent training and um, going through the home study process and all of that just to bring on one new family. Um, Somebody told me, and I don't remember the number, one of our agencies figured out how much that costs them. Um, so there can be a huge cost just for not implementing some things in, the, in this case for retention. Um, and then there's a great logic model builder. So if you're looking at a solution that you really want to propose, um, this website has a toolkit that'll walk you through kind of thinking about what is your solution and what's it going to cost and how do we, how could we implement it and how many will we need and some of those kinds of things and help you really build that as a logic model. Um, another thing that we did, and this wasn't for a specific recommendation, but last year during our legislative session, we developed a whole list of the challenges in the, ch in the child welfare system and then their corresponding solutions from the perspective of foster adoptive and kinship parents. And nobody else had done that. So we get, one of, one of my favorite uh, mentors always said, whoever, whoever puts it on paper controls the conversation. 
So we were able to sort of drive the conversation towards solutions because we had put it on paper and handed it out to legislators and the governor's office and kind of everybody. Um, so that became a really important advocacy tool for us. Um, and then is there something else on here? Yeah, Marissa, I want to say a little bit about that because I think one of the things that what I loved about what you did is that you didn't stop with what are the challenges. You had people identify challenges and then you matched up what, what you might do to solve those. And so, and where, and again, looking back at talking about where to advocate, like sort of, okay, where, what level this challenge is. So I think it's a really great, um, the way you did it was a really great way to come up with recommendations was you started with the challenges and then, but you didn't present the challenges alone. You presented it with how things might be different. Right. And that, that actually, I'll just take a second. That actually came about because we were opposing a specific move that the state wanted to do that they were saying was going to fix all these things. And it really wasn't. So I had listed all the challenges and then the solutions that they were proposing. And, and I had them as sort of a, a visual and I would give it to legislators and say, look, this isn't solving anything. And then they would say, well, then what do you suggest? And I would say, well, here's this beautiful document that has all the solutions on it. And that really helped them feel like, okay, this isn't just this big awful thing that we can't do anything about or nobody knows how to fix it you know we have these solutions here and we can start to chip away at some of them um, so the other thing with developing recommendations is you want to think again about smart goals you want your goals to be specific measurable achievable realistic and time bound so make sure it's measurable are you going to launch 20 support groups are you going to launch two support groups um, making it achievable, maybe 20 or 50 is a lot for a year. Maybe you can do two or 10 or something like that, depending on your resources and, and who you have um, and making that realistic and then time bound, giving it a, a, you know, in the next year we're going to, if we can secure this funding, we will see a difference in, you know, our goal. And you can even have it just be a goal and you may or may not achieve it, but you could even have a, we're gonna affect our, we're gonna lower our, or raise our retention rate by this much over the next five years if we implement these groups or do these other programs. Um, so making sure that you're thinking about that. And then the next slide. Okay, so this one I have. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking about both how to present your recommendation and about your partners and who you might need as partners. Power mapping is really important and really helpful. So at the center of this bullseye on your screen is the policy commitment that you're looking for, whether that's funding or changing a law or establishing a, a, a committee or something like that. Um, whatever your goal is, that's the, that's the center of the, the bullseye. And then it goes in, in the rings as we go out. So the people, most able to affect that or pass that or create that policy commitment are the key decision makers, whether that's legislators, whether that's the heads of your agent, your executive branch agencies, um, or, or directors of your private foster care agencies uh, or other people. And then, then outside of that, you may or may not have relationships with all of those key decision makers yourself or within your immediate network. Um, but you most likely have some people who are associated with those people in your network. Um, so those people have influence on the key decision makers. And then as we come farther outside the circle, you have the people who have connections to the people who have influence or are associated with the key decision makers. And sometimes it takes some effort to get to those key decision makers. But if you work your network, I, I will always say that one of the key things for me for a successful life has been just networking and being able to maintain a network. Um, I recently had it, we just had a big company come in and start doing a lot around our healthcare and someone I met with one of the directors and they, they told me that they knew someone that I used to work with who had been my supervisor at like 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, and I haven't talked to her in probably the last five or six years, but we're on Facebook and things like that. And so I sent her an email and I said, what can you tell me about this person? Well, she didn't know who I was talking about. She didn't remember the person, but she did some research. She found where he used to live and she was able to call some colleague, former colleagues of hers in that state and get me all kinds of information that was really, really valuable. So I had absolutely no connection to anybody who influenced him or knew anything about this person, but because I was able to use someone in my network who wasn't even really close to, you know, a really strong part of my network right now, who was willing to kind of do that back work for me, I was able to get some really valuable information. <laughs> so even if you don't have 
direct relationships with those key decision makers, thinking about how you can get there through your network is really important. Um, and then on the next slide, once you've kind of developed your ask, Marissa, before you go on, can I can I just add one thing? Because I think um, this is one of the I want to talk about sort of what you talk about with networking is this is when we talked earlier, Marissa talked earlier about partnering with that you don't want to do this alone. You want to you want to have you want to be an advocate with some others and you want somebody like Marissa who is a master networker. And so finding other foster adoptive kinship providers in your circle who there's somebody who is the kind of person who will talk to anybody and who will remember anybody you want that person working with you you might you know so if you're more of an introvert or you're somebody you might be the person who's gathering data you might be writing talking points so one of the things it's really important to partner with others and to do some mm -hmm. this isn't power mapping but it's strengths mapping so like in in of, the, of those of us who are working on this advocacy issue, what are different people's strengths? And I just think I wanted, I know it's not on a slide and I think, but I wanted to highlight it here because again, I think there really are, there are people who have those networks who remain uh, connected everybody and there are other people who maybe can be doing the writing or who are willing to do the legwork but so when you or if you're working in a, a support group or an association or whatever whoever you're working with you got to spend some time doing some strengths mapping as well to figure out who should be doing what so I just wanted to throw that in there before we moved on yeah that's so important and I'm really glad you said that Mary because not everybody has the same set of skills and I'm not so great at the data or the you know they the um clerical types of things maintaining a database and that kind of stuff i'm not so good at um so having those partners who help me with that and even with my networking skills i don't know everybody so having people that i can reach out to and say who do you know is so important um so once you've gone through all these steps um the last one is to evaluate celebrate recalibrate and sustain so and really you want to be doing this as you're going through the process kind of continuously. You want to always be evaluating what progress have we made, what's going well, what maybe could we improve, what maybe didn't work as well. Um, that's, you know, just always kind of thinking about how, where can we improve, but also what have we accomplished and really taking time to celebrate the things that you've accomplished. As advocates, it's so easy to get burned out um, when we are kind of pushing on, and many, so many of us are really passionate about these issues. It's really easy to get tired. It's also easy to get sucked into lots of other issues. I know I have friends who are working on education and disability and poverty and all things that sort of marginally touch child welfare, but I can't get, I have to work to not get sucked into those things so that I can stay a little focused and not really get worn out. Um, but taking the time to celebrate even small things. You know, five people showed up at the Capitol for our first ever day at the Capitol. That's huge. That can be a really big success. Um, if it's the first time that legislators are hearing from foster parents, then that that in and of itself is a success, even if it was only two of you. Um, <clears throat> so taking time to really celebrate those things, whether it's posting on your Facebook or sending thank yous or you know gathering some people and saying, hey, let's have dinner and talk about how great this was. Um, and then sharing those successes with your partners and supporters and the public. Um, which you can do again by social media, regular media. And then after you've kind of done some evaluating, recalibrating, tweaking and making some changes, um, cultivating new partnerships, maybe you identified some places where you didn't have those partnerships, um, uh, update your data, revise your messaging, and then just sustain. Remember that this is a marathon, not a sprint. In West Virginia, our legislative session is two months long. So if it doesn't happen in one year, it usually doesn't happen on here. Usually it takes two or three or four before you get a bill passed. Um, so, and even, even in an executive branch, it can take a long time to kind of build those relationships and get the change that you want, but trying to remember that it's a marathon and hang in there. And, and also on the recalibrate, I mean, it's not, sometimes it's not even tweaking or changing the strategy. It might be changing your goals. I mean, one of the things we've talked mm -hmm. about, um, and maybe not, you don't want to necessarily say, oh, automatically we're going to change it if it didn't happen this session. But um, NACAC was working on something in Minnesota recently, and everybody was very supportive until they found out what it cost. And so 
we're like, okay, so should we, this was about equalizing adoption assistance and guardianship assistance rates. And so we are, you know, we're going to keep working on it, but we may go back and say, we're going to make this a multi-year. So it's not going for equalization right away. It be, it would build up over time. It's because again, the messaging was working great, but the price tag did, you know, the money wasn't magically there. And so there may be things like that, that you want to, um, uh, that you want to think about. So not just your strategy, but even your ask may change a little bit um, depending on what you're hearing. So, Absolutely. Well, and your ask could change a lot if you're successful in getting it, um, you know, and getting what you were asking for. And then you go, okay, well, now we accomplished that. So let's focus on something different. Um, or maybe something changes significantly in the state and you don't really want to ask that anymore. Um, so um, here's some data and resources that you can draw on and um, I assume you'll have access to this. So, <coughs> excuse me, the um, the links here, the Child's Bureau of Child Welfare Outcomes, um, they have some reports that have really good data. Um, child trends on, on adoption, foster care, and kinship in your state, you can look at those. Um, the members of Congress, if you don't know who your members of Congress are or your folks in your circles don't, that's a great um, website to go and you can just put in your, your address and it'll pull up who you're representatives are. And then the same thing there for state legislators as well. Um, another one that I don't see on there is uh, your child um, child count data, kids count data. Kids there count. Kids count. <laughs> Sorry, my, my brain wasn't getting it, um, which is done on a state by state basis. And then they, they um, gather national trends and stuff as well. So there's a lot of data there that you can draw. On. If you just Google kids count for your state, you should be able to find it. So we just covered a whole lot of stuff. Are there any questions? Yeah, it mean, will give folks a little bit of time. If you have any questions so far, please uh, type them again. There, we've got some more stuff to cover, so we're not done yet. But feel free to ask your questions now, or we'll have some time at the end as well. Yeah. Um, uh, Marissa, I have one question for you about when, when you're working with your group, how you figure out what your advocacy priorities are as a as a group process. Or, I mean, I know you talked about the highlighting some of those challenges, but how do you narrow down um, what you focus on as a group? That's great. Thank you. Um, so our group, as I said, is fairly new. And the biggest way that we interact right now is in our Facebook group, which is over 500 people. So it's kind of large but a lot of input there um, so what I have typically done is and eventually I hope that we'll have annual meetings and we'll be able to, to really do some work face to face but right now um, I we do a lot of just posting and peer support kinds of things in the Facebook group and then I'm able to kind of identify some trends and challenges I will usually put together a document and then share it with the group sometimes that gets challenging because there are people in the group who are very closely connected to leaders that I don't always want to know my strategies <laughs> or my goals right away. Um, so that can be challenging. So I also have a board that I will vet things through if I need to kind of wait until closer to session or closer to, to something before I get it out there more publicly. But um, And then I ask the group for input. What in this document, like in our challenges and solutions, what um, what's missing? What do you think needs to change? What is not a top priority? And then in terms of like narrowing down, I have a list of 10 legislative priorities for this next session, but in terms of narrowing down my top three, the criteria I use, obviously, and I have my members, I'll give input into this as well, but are, you know, what are, what are the most pressing needs, but also what is the most doable right now, or what are legislators most interested in at the moment? Um, so I try to kind of focus on that piece as well. If I'm, if I, it's something that I think is going to take a whole lot of time to implement or a lot of time, you know, then I want to go for sort of sort of what I think of as the low hanging fruit sometimes, but then also have a couple that are, are maybe going to take a little bit longer. And I think that's, uh, yeah. And I, I think I mentioned this earlier that sometimes I think the low hanging fruit is a really good one, especially if you're new to advocacy or something with a low price tag or no price tag, mm -hmm. even better. Um, they can get people thinking about your issues. Um, and again, this where it might be starting, uh, you know, foster care advisory board or, um, you know, doing a report, something with a low, a low cost might be a good way to start. 
um, if you're just beginning to do advocacy so that because everybody can come and ask for millions of dollars or tens of millions. But if you can do something that you can show will have an impact and not be that expensive. Um, and again, I think about Tony's, you know, banning conversion therapy is a good example of something that actually doesn't have a cost. Um, right. Legislators like things that don't cost money. That, again, that doesn't that mean that the, in this political climate, it doesn't mean that that's an easy one to ask for. So, um, anyway. Yep. And your, your, your ask or your goal doesn't always have to be a policy change per se. One of the things when I first started building our association, one of my, one of my main goals was just to elevate the voice of foster parents, just to have us present at the Capitol. So by my being able to be there and you know speak to legislators and then invite other people to come and interact with legislators and we did a rally one day last year, um, it, that in and of itself and now tomorrow I'm going to a meeting where we're crafting the language for a bill. To me, that's a huge win. I mean, I started this because I wanted to make sure we were at the table when they're making those decisions and now we're there and we're driving the discussion. So that doesn't that didn't take a vote by anybody. It didn't take a, a policy change per se. It was just us sort of stepping up and doing it and coming together to really make sure that our voices are heard. And that that's a huge win to me. <coughs> so any other questions? We did have um, one question from Spencer that talking about, and again, I don't know if you'll have an answer to this, but interested in looking at the conflict that arises between foster parents and county agencies, particularly around reunification policies versus best interests of the child legal standard. So I don't know if that is something that you've addressed or. Um, yeah, we haven't gotten into it a lot. Um, it's a it's a really challenging one to address um, because of course, best interest of the child can be interpreted a lot of different ways. Um, and there, there can be some, some real tension there. Um, I tend to deal with that a lot one-on-one -on -one in my conversations with, with members of our association um, and helping them kind of think through and remember that the goal, at least in West Virginia and usually nationwide, this is true, the goal of foster care is reunification. So kind of remembering that piece of it, but then also looking at, you know, we do need to make sure that the, the child is, is cared for and is not being put back into an unsafe situation and that we're thinking about um, permanency and bonding and all those attachment and all those, those pieces. Um, but that, yeah, that can be a really challenging one. I think for me, part of the reason I haven't broached that subject yet is because I need to build more relationships so having a really strong relationship at the county level or the state level, whichever your your state is, um, where you can sort of address. So I'm able to talk about those issues, for example, with Children's Home Society, our, one of our private agencies, with from sort of a philosophical perspective and get their thinking on it because I've built a really strong relationship. The state level, that's a little harder to do. Um, so I think over time, we'll build those relationships and be able to address some of that. Does that help answer your question at all. I don't know. And, and also, I'll just add on to it a little bit that I think one of the things there is, um, I know when some people talk about timelines, well, one of the things to look at is from an advocacy perspective is, are the services there to support the birth families, birth parents yeah. as they're trying to work their case plan? Is there treatment available? Are there mental health services? Whatever the issues they are having, is the system providing the support that they need? Because if you can say we provided all the support and they aren't able to do it and we've worked with them, we've partnered with them, that's really different than saying, you know, these people are trying to work the case plan, but there's not things in place. And so I think um, it's really important to have that perspective. And and again, if you're talking about this, if you can partner with birth parent, with birth parents who've been through the system and they can talk about what's worked and what, what it, can, it can be much less adversarial if you're not doing it as where it can appear to be foster parents against birth parents. But if foster parents and birth parents can work together on how to, um, how to provide these services and how to make these decisions in the best interest of the child, you can have some really interesting conversations. And because what ends up happening, I think, in some of the cases that Spencer's talking about is the, you know, the county agency is um, ending up being part of the, you know, taking the role of the birth parent. Um, so anyway, so I think that's one of the, one of the things to talk about. Yeah, that's a great one. Do we get any more questions? Um, I, there's a question that I'm gonna, 
Um, and I'll just say Spencer has followed, but do you ever see permanency becoming the focus rather than reunification um, as we continue to see the opioid ep epidemic? And I think, you know, permanency is ultimately, I mean, the legal standard is permanency, um, but the first choice in permanency is reunification. And in I, almost every state, if not every state, it's then relative placement because we know that's, uh, I mean, that's good for kids. And so I think permanency is always the focus. And we know that reunification happens, uh, well, in terms of exits nationally, exits from foster care, but these days it's about 50%. It's actually been dropping a little bit. And some of that could be uh, because fewer kids are being brought into care who don't need to be, you know, so maybe some of the quick reunifications that where there didn't really need to be a placement um, aren't happening. So I do think that, again, the, the federal standard is that it's permanency. It's just that reunification is the first goal and should be the first goal. Um, and there are some timelines on that. And with the Adoption and Safe Families Act, there are timelines that um, in terms of how, you know, what happens at what court hearings and, and those are things that you can see is your state uh, how is your state doing in terms of those timelines? That's part of the Child and Family Services Review to see if your state is having a hard time meeting those timelines, then again, are, is do you need more advocacy on our services available? Because one of the things that may slow things is if you have pa parents who aren't able to get the services they need. Um, so. Yeah, and that's a huge issue in our state, access to services and transportation to services, and those those are, very yeah. big barriers oftentimes. So yeah, the, which messes up the timeline. And we know that the timeline is set largely because of the needs of the kids, but, right. um, but yeah, that can be really challenging to navigate. And it's a huge balance. So the other question Jackie is asking, how can we find data about how parent support groups in other states are funding things like respite and mentorship programs? And I'll say that I don't think there's a great uh, resource on that. I think we have some of it that we can share. There's uh, NACIC did as part of the Adopt US Kids Project uh, a publication called Support Matters, um, which we can send a link to. Um, while well, Marissa is talking next, I can put the link in the um, in the chat box. But um, and it has information about it. Has we in that we highlighted a number of um, programs that we thought were good, and it talks about how those are funded. Um, if we're talking about on the adoption side, um, most states the most common funding source is Title IV B Part Two, also known as safe, uh, promoting safe and stable families. I think I'm getting that right. And um, on foster care, the primary funding source is Title IV E, of course. Um, but it's anyway, adoption incentive funds are often used. And now, again, this is on the adoption side. Um, states are required to present to spend 20% of what is complicated funding. But the Fostering Connections Act uh, expanded adoption assistance eligibility, which meant states get more federal money. And they're required uh, since 2018 to spend 20% of that on post adoption or guardianship support. Um, and 30% of it on supporting all families. And so those are some of the, the top sources, but there is, I will get, uh, well, Marissa's talking in the next section, I will throw a link in there about some others, but, um, and we can also, uh, if anybody has specific questions, we can try to find some other information. But again, there's not usually a national database of that. We, um, uh, but we can share what we know from different states. Some other thoughts on funding quickly is, um, think outside the box of federal or state funding. Um, so right now as an association, we have one full-time staff and we're about to bring on five VISTAs, which cost about $15,000, I think each. So they're full-time volunteers who get a small living stipend, but they'll be really helpful to our, our work. And I don't have any state funding. Um, it's all through foundations. I've gotten some funding from um, a couple of our, our private foster care agencies. Um, I've gotten some funding from our managed care organization who just moved into the state and we'll probably get some more from them. Um, so there are other places to look. You can write some grants there in West Virginia, especially there are a lot of small local foundations that will that love to fund that kind of thing. Support for families, um, even if it's, you know, five or $10,000, that can, that can really go a long way when you're talking about support groups, um, unless you're trying to hire staff, which as Mary said, we do need to have um, some staff, but even then local foundations or state foundations can be really helpful for that stuff. Um, and then reaching out to your, you know, your other partners and nonprofits, sometimes they have some unencumbered money that they can 
throw you a couple thousand dollars. I mean, it's not going to be hundreds of thousands, but um, those are all kind of creative places. And then a lot of times there are um, businesses that also either are required, like in West Virginia, our banks are required to give some community funding. Um, we have a Toyota plant, so they a lot of times will give funding for things. So looking at businesses headquartered in your area and other places to get some funding is important too. So um, on to advocacy with specific audiences. <coughs> Fundraising can be a form of, of advocacy. Excuse my coughing here. Um, you've heard me talk quite a bit about legislative advocacy. It's one of my favorite things to do. So that's why we're coming up on our session pretty soon here. So that's part of why I keep mentioning it. But um, when you're doing legislative advocacy, the, you know, the first step is really to study your issue. Um, know the system, find the allies who can really help you show, the, show you the ropes. So again, that's where your unlikely partners may come in. Um, when I, I used to work for our state commission for the deaf and hard of hearing, and I found myself often at education committee meetings because we were working on education issues. And I was always in the meeting with the lobbyist for the, the teachers union who would not have been somebody that I would have seen as an ally for the deaf community, but she was a huge ally in helping me understand how the legislative process worked, connecting me to key legislators, um, you know, helping me build relationships with staff and, and other people. Um, and so that was really important for me to have. And I, even now I have some partners who really don't have anything to do with child welfare, but they know the legislative system in and out. <coughs> um, find your audience. So, in this case, um, legislators, but think think through the committees that you, that your bill will go to. So in um, West Virginia, child welfare bills go mostly through the Department of or the the health committees. Uh, sometimes through we our House has a uh, Children and Families Committee. The Senate does not. Sometimes they'll go through the Judiciary Committee because if it has to do with the legal system, um, and then uh, if there's money attached, then it's going to go through finance. So thinking about which committees your bills might go through and um, who is on those committees and who you need to, who are the chairs, um, who do you already have relationships who are on those committees who can help you make, get some, make some headway in those committees. Um, consider your timing. So every state has a little bit different um, time when their, their legislature's in session. Some states, it's they're in session all year, um, sort of like the federal Congress. Um, I think Pennsylvania is one of those states where they they tend to be in pretty much all year. Um, uh, most, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry about that. Uh, most do start in January. There are some that don't, but most tend to start in January. In West Virginia, ours is 60 days long. It starts the second Wednesday in January and runs through March, through the, through mid March. Um, and then in our state. In between March and the following January, they have monthly two to three day meetings. They call them legislative interims. At those meetings, they don't convene, so they can't vote on any bills, but they study issues. So they have people come and present to the committee meetings and they um, craft bills and think about what they want to introduce and things like that. So, um, so that gives us some time to work with them and to build those relationships and go to the meetings and see what they're learning about. Um, Identify your, and you also want to think about, I know in Minnesota, they have, they only do the budget every two years, so you can't be asking for anything that costs money on a non-budget year. Um, Mary, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so thinking about those little quirks in your system and your, your partners and allies which should be able to help you um, sort out some of those pieces. And then identifying your allies. Um, we've talked a lot about that. And then um, plan for your interaction. So call and schedule a meeting that can be really important um, <coughs> often meeting with legislators while they're home and not in the capitol is a really good time to do that because a lot of times they'll have more time to meet with you um, and especially if you're the, if they know you're their constituent and you're voting for them then they're um, even more excited about meeting with you um, so scheduling a time and it can be at the capitol while they're in session if that's the best time and then um, following up with them afterwards too, sending the documents you said you'd send, sending thank yous, um, showing appreciation for their time, those kinds of things will all help with building building that relationship. Um, and then just knowing your your process. So most states have a bicameral legislature where they, every bill has to go through the House and the Senate. There are a few that only have one, um, which probably streamlines, streamlines the process. I've never done advocacy in one of those states though. Um, 
So understanding, you know, like we have deadlines in our legislative session where you can't introduce a new bill after this date and it has to be done in the in the first the house of origin by this date and you know there's key dates where you really kind of need to know what you're working with um anything i'm missing on legislative mary i'll just add one thing which is that and you were absolutely right about minnesota that you know there's budget years and non-budget years but i also even if you're in a non-budget year we've started some of our advocacy that has a price tag in a non-budget year we just have to acknowledge we go in and say hey we know this isn't going to be this year but we're right now we're just trying to build allies and we can get supporters and so again if you know the system it doesn't because as, as marissa said earlier you know this is a this is a long-term process so even if you know again you, just because something doesn't happen in session doesn't mean you shouldn't be talking about it and so you can do lots of work before session um, or in a session that's not even the right session because you're still building your allies, you're building your relationships, you're doing those conversations. Um, it's helpful to know that so they don't, you know, they don't think, oh, well, they don't, why is she bringing this up this year? But anyway, I just wanted to add that. Right. Yeah, that's really key. Um, I mean, and a lot of times too, it, with us for a 60 day session, there's, I mean, it almost always takes more than a year, although not always, there have been some things that have gone through quickly, but, um, and sometimes you got to watch those too because sometimes they'll sneak something in that you don't want to happen <laughs> so monitoring what what else is happening is also important um but and sometimes we'll get to the very end and think everything's going to pass and then all of a sudden it gets vetoed or you know fails in in a committee or doesn't come back to the floor or so a conference committee kills it um so just knowing that okay well we just start over again next year and we identify where the challenges were and um and then uh starting early is all, always a good thing too so um with executive branch you know again so it's it can be very similar so much of it goes back to knowing your audience knowing your ask so um you're not going to ask the legislature well you you may not need to ask the legislature to create an advisory board or a committee you may be able to accomplish that through an executive branch um official or a meeting with the executive branch that you may end up needing legislation or it may be good to put that into legislation but there are some things um like you can't really i had to do some ed educating with some of my members that i can't ask the executive branch to fix the, ju the judicial branch unfortunately they don't have any control over that <coughs> there are some intersections but in terms of what judges do and time you know some of the timelines and things like they can't do a whole lot about um so kind of knowing your audience and what you're asking for um, studying the agency policies. So we talked about legislation and there's the laws, there's regulations which help to implement the laws, and then there's your agency policy, which does not go through the legislature or any um, elected body. It goes through the, it's really just essentially written and set by the executive branch. So um, under, and that's really what like your caseworkers are looking at in terms of how they carry out the process. Um, so knowing those agency policies, knowing what your issue is, um, learning the opportunities for involvement. Does your agency already have, or your state agency already have an advisory board, a committee, a work group that you can join? Um, in our state, this in the past year, they started a monthly collaborative meeting where it's open to the public and we get lots and lots of different organizations who show up and they just kind of do all these updates on different issues and they'll sometimes have speakers. But it's a great way. We, usually the deputy secretary of the state department's there, the commissioner of the Bureau for Children and Families, sometimes the deputy secretary or the secretary is there so it's a great way to have and one of my networking tips if you're not if it doesn't come naturally to you is the most important time of any meeting you schedule on your calendar is the five minutes after it ends so i always leave some time in my in my schedule for that at least a half an hour because that's when i can go grab somebody and say hey i wanted to pick your brain about this or i'm wondering what you think about this or how was your thanksgiving or you know just kind of build those relationships but making those face-to-face -face connections is really important. <laughs> so if you have something specific you wanna to talk to your executive branch about, again, schedule a meeting, uh, prepare ahead of time for the meeting. If you can put something in writing or bring something, some data or some you know, plan that you've put in writing, again, whoever puts it on, in, on paper first controls the conversation. Um, so having that, that ready to go is a great tool and then follow up, send your thank yous, um send what you said you would do you know do what you said you would do and then follow up with them um and then working with the media marissa, another, marissa yeah. i think we're yeah. going to skip um okay. we are almost out of time so let's skip ahead if it's all right with you yes um 
talk a little bit about sharing your story. And again, I'm going to give this very short shrift, um, but I wanted to do a little bit of it um, before we run out of time. And and thanks for everyone to hanging in here. And then if you have questions, and again, including questions about the media, if you feel free to ask them, we'll stay on as long as you guys want us to, but we want to get, uh, get some more content in before we get to 3.30 uh, Central Time. So I want to talk a little bit about the power of personal story, because I think that's one of the things that NACAC is so uh, believes in this power um, the, of parents and young people to share their experiences as key advocacy messages. And again, I, I am not a parent. I've not had personal experience with foster care or adoption. But so one of the things I love to do is partner with those who can tell their stories and I can be the data person and can talk about other things. But again, whether you partner with somebody or do it your own, just know that your uh, your story is what paints a picture. It's what makes people remember things. We, you know, a story is what makes things change. Um, sometimes for the bad, like one story will, uh, can, can make a, can make a difference. That's not always for good, but it's really powerful when people hear what an experience is like from someone. So I, I want you to think about that as your one of your strongest advocacy currency, I'd say it's right up there with the networking that Marissa talks about in terms of the value. Um, you know, what your stories can touch, uh, you know, can touch a legislator's heart if you talk about a child who was struggling and was able to get, uh, you know, parenting support and then is doing better and as a result is thriving. That shows a real difference. And, and I, you know, I believe in pairing stories with data so that if you can tell this story and then say there are 500 other kids in, you know, group homes who need a family just like this child, or there are 8,000 kids in our, uh, in foster care and they've all experienced loss. Um, those are, I think, really good to pair together. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about, um, about how you tell your story and how you pick it. And some of it is just what we were talking about earlier with advocacy. So first you want to identify your goal. So let's say um, you want, I'll, I'll tell a story that we, Marissa and I heard in a training that we did. Um, you want to talk about information sharing. So sharing information with foster parents and how critically important it is. And, and I asked if anyone had a story related to that. And so, so you say you want to improve making sure that uh, when a child is newly placed that they get full information that the caregivers foster or adopt to get full information about the child and their needs. Um, and, and so the consequences of when that doesn't happen, so this um, foster parent told us about a child who came to stay with him, a teenager, and they, you know, had said she'd suffered from depression, but did not, but no one told him and they knew that um, she was literally suicidal and was throwing herself um, down the stairs. And so this child comes to the home and this happens and is completely unprepared for what would happen. And the child, you know, could have, he was able to prevent anything from happening, but just barely. And again, so that power, and I'm not doing him justice at all. Um, but I think that it's a very powerful story. You don't have to get into all the details. I did it pretty quickly. He told it quickly, but it gets somebody like, oh my God, this is why we need foster parents and adoptive parents to have information about their kids and their care. I get it. So they're just, and again, if you talk about it using the child's name and the parent's name, making it very real to people. Um, and I just want to say a couple other things about, so you want to think about, you know, that's your, so your goal is about information sharing. You want to decide what stories go well to that goal. So again, to me, when he told this story, I was like, oh my God, that is, that is a story that makes it so pertinent. I'll, another one uh, we had, we were, when we were advocating for support services and peer support, we had a foster adoptive parent come and she talked about her first placement. Um, her child was, a very young child was in a crib and he would cry and cry whenever he's in the crib. And she talked to other parents who said, well, you should let him cry it out. He's old enough. Um, and she, then she talked and it wasn't working. The kid was really getting ramped up. And then she talked to another foster parent who's like, oh, this is a kid who was probably left abandoned in a crib. He's feeling abandoned. It's not, you know, this is not the same as another child who maybe is going to adjust and learn to sleep it out. And she realized she had basically been re-traumatizing her child. Um, as a, and that was because of the peer support. And again, that's a pretty simple story. Any of you foster experienced parents are probably like, well, if, duh, of course that was what was happening. But again, she was talking to parents who hadn't parented kids who's experienced trauma and loss. And again, I think it's a very simple story that shows great power of what you can learn. Um, 
And so I want to just say a couple of things about, and then you want to, again, so you think about the messages that relate to the goal. You talk about, you develop your talking points. Um, and I'll say just a couple of things um, that I'm not, I don't have a slide for, but um, when you're telling your story, the best thing to do is be your own toughest critic and your own editor. Um, I, I always give my example of I, I have weird dreams and I like to tell people my dreams. And of course, nobody really cares as much about it as I do. And it doesn't really work. So I have to be my own editor. If I'm going to tell you a story about my dream, I have to remember not tell you all the weird, funny things that happen and big picture why I remember it and why it matters. And so you have to do the same thing with your personal story. So again, you may have a lot of information about what has happened and you want to distill it to just a two or three points. Again, the two examples I gave, I think do that. Um, you want to keep it as simple as possible um, so that people can really focus on what matters. And so I'd say one of, and you also don't want to give, especially if you're talking about your children, we don't want to share too much information about our child's history. So I said, use names when you can, but if it's a you know foster placement, you don't, you might not want to. Um, you, know, you want to protect the child first and also make sure you talk about them uh, at children and the families you're working with as people first. So you're not talking about a child just in terms of their disability. You want people to care about um, them. So you want to, you know, highlight, you know, my, the child who's with me, she loves to run. She loves to play. Books are her favorite thing in the world. But as a result of what's happened to her in the past, she goes into rages sometimes that I don't know what to deal with. And we need, I need peer support and I need a crisis support that will help her and the kids like her. So again, you want to make sure that you're talking about kids as real kids so that people care, but also really getting sort of quickly to what the key issues are. And I don't know... Um, and, and it's okay, I'd say, is, again, if you know other families, you, so you can, if you're, if you don't have a personal story, you say, you know, I, I know another parent who's been through this and, you know, tell their stories. If you can get uh, young people to participate, and I mean, some of the most powerful advocates I've seen about support are young people who have um, had their own experiences with raging and loss. We worked with a young woman who ran away all the time. And she now as a young adult can talk about what that was feeling like to her and why the, um, why she did that and how she needed support and her families, her parents needed support to understand what was happening with her. So that was a really quick, uh, bit about stories that Marissa, I don't know if you have anything you want to add, but otherwise we are open for questions. If anybody has any, um, about anything we've covered. And again, sorry to sort of buzz through that really quickly, but I did want to highlight a couple things there. Okay, so I don't, it looks like we don't have any new questions. So Marissa, unless you have anything to add, I think we can wrap it up. But again, I, I have our contact information here um, on this slide uh, that you can reach out to either one of us to ask follow-up questions. We're here to, you know, if you have a specific thing you're working on, we can perhaps help you with it and uh, we'd be happy to share more information. Awesome. Thank you for joining us and listening. And um, as Mary said, feel free to reach out with questions. We're always happy to answer and to provide some peer support for advocacy. I know when I first started doing it, I always had a million questions. So um, it's helpful to have some other people in places. I'm often asking Mary, where can I get this data? Or what resources do you have? What tools have you used around this particular issue? Um, so we're happy to help with that and glad you could be here. All right. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, everyone. Again, and you'll, you, I know we asked, I think we mentioned this, I answered earlier, we, you, we will um, post the recording of this and you'll get a link to it if you want to listen to it again or share it. And again, if you have any feedback for us on what you wish we'd covered and we may have other training, so we, we love feedback. So feel free, you'll get an email, you can reply to that. Again, thank you, Marissa. Thank you, everyone. And have a great afternoon. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, everyone.